Bonsoir à tous, bonsoir à toutes et à tous. Je suis Bertrand Buchwalter, I'm the director of the Institut Français du Royaume-Uni, and together with the team, we are, we are delighted to welcome you tonight for this special event with a special guest. Um, on, uh, on February 6 uh, this year, Her Majesty uh, the Queen uh, was the first, became the first British monarch to uh, celebrate the Platinum Jubilee marking 70 years of uh, service to the people of the United Kingdom and of uh, the Commonwealth. And we wanted to mark this uh, unprecedented, unprecedented anniversary uh, with this uh, special event. Uh, those of you, and I'm sure there are many of you, uh, who watched yesterday the, the Queen's speech in the House of uh, Lords, um, will have been struck as I was by the image of uh, the crown uh, lying on the, on the cushion. Like um, Gustave Flaubert was uh, used to say about the writer, I mean, how the writer, a writer should be in, in, in his own work, um, the Queen was uh, nowhere to be seen, but was present everywhere. Tonight we'll be talking more specifically about Her Majesty's um, relationship uh, with, uh, with France. Um, and, we have, uh, and we are very honored and we are very glad to have uh, on the stage uh, really like uh, uh, the most distinguished experts uh, of uh, the British uh, monarchy. Um, Marc Roche, I will start with, uh, with uh, Marc Roche, he's a London correspondent for Le Point, a columnist for the BBC, and royal consultant for TF1 LCI. Uh, and uh, Mark, you are the author of uh, a number of uh, books on the, on the monarchy, on the British uh, monarchy, and uh, one that will be also available uh, downstairs after the for 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 signature after the after the event. Yes. Mm -hmm. oh. Yes. <laughs> Robert uh, Lacey uh, is a British, uh, a very um, well-known uh, British uh, biographer and uh, the author of uh, many uh, international bestsellers. Uh, you've been writing about Her Majesty the Queen for, and about the royal family for more than 40 years. Uh, and you are the historical consultant for uh, a series that we have uh, been uh, watching, binge-watching on, uh, on Netflix, uh, The Crown. Um, and uh, Benedict Pavio, uh, thank you, Benedict, for accepting also uh, our invitation. We'll share, uh, we'll share to tonight's uh, event. We'll be the, the moderator. Benedict uh, Pavio doesn't need much introduction, but uh, for those who don't know Benedict uh, yet, she's the uh, UK correspondent for France 24, as we say in, uh, in English, uh, but for the, uh, for the English uh, language and French language uh, uh, channel. Last but not least, we have uh, the honor also to uh, have a very, to also another very special uh, guest, uh, a surprise guest of sorts, uh, the legendary photographer Arthur Edwards, who will also comment on some pictures uh, of Her Majesty the, the Queen, uh, pictures that he was very um, uh, generous uh, to, 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 to lend to the, uh, to, to lend uh, us for this, uh, for this event. And you may have seen on the entrance of the before coming to the to the listed library, we have also uh, pulled out from our uh, from our archives, the archives of the Institut Français, uh, some documents about the, the state visit of uh, President Charles de Gaulle back then, uh, and also some uh, some uh, pieces of archives with uh, of his encounter with Her Majesty the Queen. Without further ado, uh, I leave the stage to to Benedict, and uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight for this uh, special event. Thank you. Well, yes, good evening. Benedict Pavio, uh, half French, half British, did all my schooling at the French Lycée, um, and this library holds very many memories, and it's the very first time uh, I've agreed to do an event for the Institut, um, and I'm in very distinguished company. And here we are, we're talking about the woman who is the most recognized, the most famous on the planet, who needs no introduction, who is this incredible public figure, uh, and yet remains somewhat of an enigma. I broadcast, um, as yesterday, for example, was doing uh, the Queen's speech, or should we say Charles's speech, or should we say Boris Johnson's speech? Um, I could go on, I won't. Um, 
But here are the real experts. Uh, these are the people who have been uh, writing books about it, studying it, and speaking to all kinds of people that you and I don't have access to. So I think the word access might come up in this conversation. I don't normally warn my guests what I'm going to ask them. But uh, then Mark is a friend, Arthur is a friend, and I hope that at some point, Robert, you'll become a friend because that means I can have more access to you and do my job better. So our mission, should we decide to accept it tonight, is to, you think, hands up, do you think you know quite a lot about the Queen? Do you think you know a lot about the Queen? Not one single hand went up. Okay, so I think we can deduce that most of us, even those who do it professionally, uh, might be able to offer a few insights. So let's start with the distinguished uh, guest that is Marc Roche. You have written several books. Your one is, this one is coming on the 19th of May. I understand that it will be available. Very good, thank you very much. Mirror, mirror on the wall. Now, this is quite a catchy title, Les Borgia Bacchiam, but maybe I won't kick off there. Maybe I will ask you, is the Queen a Francophile? <clears throat> Thank you, Benedict. Great pleasure to be on the same stage with an old friend of mine. Um, the Queen is very Francophile, unlike other members of the royal family. I mean, Prince Charles speaks fluently French, but it's not really, doesn't have the link with France that the Queen has. He's more interested in the Arab world, in Asia. Um, Camilla, of course, is at the head of Emmaus UK, which is the British uh, equivalent of NGO against poverty in France. William doesn't speak a word of uh, French, or very little. So the Queen is unique because, as you all know, her French is very fluent, with a little accent, a bit rusty over the years. Um, France is a country she has visited most, five official visits, visited most in Europe. Canada is the one she has been most. Um, but she went five official visits as queen, one as princess, and several private visits uh, in Normandy. She has known all the French president of the Fourth and the Fifth Republic, which is extraordinary. Who does she like and who does she not ah, like? Do we, we know? Come, I will come Tell in us. a second. Uh, it is the influence, of course, of her mother, who was Scottish, who was a great Francophile, who spoke fluently French. She's also a Duchess still today of Normandy, and she used to have a house there. But more than anything, Fra French is Me the know. only foreign language she speaks. She doesn't speak German. Um, although her family is back, back uh, of German origin. Who are the French presidents she liked? There are three types. The one she liked most, the one she has consideration, and the one she didn't like at all, <laughs> which are the one you, you are all interested in. So let's start with the good news. So Who did the she one like? she liked most was, of course, General de Gaulle because of the war, because of the link he had with uh, parents who protected him when there was a fight with Churchill. Um, there was also, of course, uh, despite the problems of the Vive le Québec Libre in uh, 67 in Montreal, and uh, despite the two veto uh, to the British uh, coming into Europe of uh, 63 and 67, she has always kept a fond memory of General de Gaulle. She liked Pompidou because he was the heir to de Gaulle, but also because he mixed a sort of rural good sense with the fact that he was a banker from Rothschild and also that he was a great Anglophile, extremely subtle and extremely arty. Mitterrand was on one of her favorites. She found him extremely, quote unquote, interesting um, because of his interest Oops. in history. Uh, uh, um, but do hold up the microphone, please. And of course, she was very uh, happy about the fact that uh, France helped uh, Britain in the uh, Falklands, and of course, the inauguration of the Channel Tunnel. She's 
is also the president she has known best over 14 years, two mandates of seven years. And of course, he coined this marvelous phrase, elle est une vraie reine, she's a real queen. Um, then we go to the one which she had consideration without really liking or disliking them. There was Jacques Chirac, of course, who she uh, thought was a very good looking man, lots of humor, spoke very good English. Um, and Giscard d'Estaing, with whom she had, uh, in the beginning, a difficult relationship because she didn't understand his English. He, he tried to speak to her in English, but uh, she didn't understand the word. He told me when I wrote the book. He recognized it. Um, she didn't like his aristocratic... So he knew, she, he knew that she didn't like him? Well, no. Ah. Because um, he's uh, of an aristocratic origin or pretended aristocratic, and he yeah. told me that um, they were very great Anglophiles in okay. the way uh, he was raised up with an with a, uh, English governant. Um, but the Queen forever was very uh, happy about him because he told her uh, when Ceausescu, the Romanian dictator, came to uh, uh, London after Paris, be careful, they've stolen, he and his wife, all the golden cutlery. <laughs> and so in the, um, uh, the Queen had all the golden cutlery take away and they got normal cutlery. <laughs> Sounds which, like when which Queen they, Victoria used to visit, that's what which people Which they used stole to do. also. Um, oh, no. no, with the next generation like Sarkozy and Hollande, the relationship were a bit more difficult. Sarkozy, um, was very nervous, he was ill at ease, he's not very uh, uh, modern. Uh, fortunately, Carla Bruni saved the day wow. by uh, doing a perfect reverence. And uh, she speaks perfectly English, and she was absolutely delightful, and uh, the Queen forget about um, her husband, and, <laughs> and uh, particularly forgave him for going to bed before the Queen. Ooh. But it was at Windsor, and they were newly led, Mrs. Bruni told me, to justify it. <laughs> um, and finally, Hollande was really the only one she didn't like, um, for two reasons. One, at the Elysee uh, banquet, he made a toast without drinking the champagne, and he made her wait, and he ignored her, basically because he was more interested in trying to mediate already then between France, uh, between uh, Ukraine and Russia. Um, and uh, he wasn't very interested in the visit. He, he spent all his time speaking to journalists, because the great difference between the British court and French presidency is, of course, journalists are welcome at the Elysee. So those are the relationship. Macron, she um, spoke to him. She has seen him in multicultural event, but basically um, he's waiting and he will get an official. So visit. she was at the um, in Cornwall at um, the yeah. G7. They went to the yeah. Eden um, yeah. and project. They met on the V Day. V -day yeah, V Day. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah, yeah, was there too. Yeah. Okay, tell us a bit about Madame Antoinette de Belègue, who taught the Queen French at the tender age of 14. Yes, um, Madame de Belègue. Oh, pardon. Madame de Belègue is a Belgian aristocrat who, uh, from uh, Wallonia, French speaking, um, who married a French aristocrat. Then uh, his job took him to um, London. And then he joined the Free French at the beginning of the war, and she was on her own with two children, and she needed a job and money. And so she joined uh, Alec Harding. Yes, the private secretary. Uh, Alec Harding was the, the, the private secretary, secretary of George VI at the time. Exactly, to take care of the three daughters to the French. In '42, the Queen Mother simply stole Madame de Belleg from the Harding, and she was the teacher of French, but not only French, French civilization, European civilization, and uh, 
as she said, formation générale. I don't know yes, how there you... was the feeling that, um, um, I think it was the Queen Mother, felt that France was a very good channel for um, her daughters to learn about European civilization in general, and I'm sure. Well, you she would ha agree obviously with that. had very good taste. <laughs> what can I say? And but until 48, just finishing on Madame de Belleg, after she uh, remarried, went to the US, she just once said anything about her time with the Queen to a biography. Uh, in the 70s, Longfoot. Mm -hmm. um, but that's the only time she never said a word. She stayed in contact with the Queen and she refused. You mean she never gave away the secret? No. Un Nothing, unlike not another nanny we might not mention yeah. who wrote a book about it. Mm. Absolutely. Yes. Very and naughty. she stayed friend with the Queen yeah. and uh, uh, refused all honours. Mm. Except that of serving the Queen. Mm. Um, Mark. You have some interesting contacts and you've been to some interesting places. Amongst them, you attended two banquets at Windsor Castle, one given for Pre President Chirac, one given for President Sarkozy. Uh, you also went to a banquet for the Queen which was held at the Elysee Palace. Possibly, that must be the one you're referring to with President Hollande. So, what differences of style were there between the Windsor Castle version of the banquet and the Elysee Palace of the banquet? And I'm not just referring to the president now. I'm talking about the way in which, you know, the porcelain, the waiting, who, do you, who are you seated next to? And have you ever spoken to Her Majesty herself? Um, <clears throat> well, they are the same in a way because you have uh, the army, you have the music, you have the uniform. It's quite formal. Um, where they differ completely is that at Windsor there was one enormous table for 180 people. You can't move really because stuck, so you have you can't speak to the other person. So if you are stuck with two people you don't particularly like, uh, you are stuck for three hours there. Uh, at the Elysee, those are small tables. It reminds me of a wedding, um, and the food is great at both places, the wines are great, simply the French give bread, give cheese, and foie gras. <laughs> you haven't answered my other question. Have you spoken to the Queen? Yes, I have spoken. When and uh, where? Well, what well, did she say? What did you say? Well, I, think, I think French journalists get more chance to speak to the Queen than most British journalists. That's possibly Arthur true. Arthur Edwards accepted. That's so. possibly true, but we still want to know what he said and what the Queen said. Well, she, as Arthur said, and uh, she is always the same question, very polite question. How long have you been in this country? Do you like it? And uh, last question about uh, the event itself, which you are. But at, on two occasions, the Queen came out of her reserve. One was in 2002, we were invited. I suppose you were there, all the media. It was just between the two rounds of the French presidential election. Uh, Le Pen, father, had won the second place and was facing Chirac. And I said to the Queen, the situation in France is not very great. And she said, um, uh, I hope the French vote well. And so next day, Le Monde, which I was working for, made the headline, the Queen supports Chirac, and the palace was very happy about my indiscretion. The second time she told me... Sorry, you said happy or unhappy? Happy, because she was against the extreme right. So it was good for the image. Um, and the second time was uh, uh, when... Uh, uh, in uh, Zimbabwe, there was a Commonwealth meeting, and uh, Ch children. yeah, and uh, we was introduced uh, to the Queen, and she uh, asked me, "Are the French interested in the Commonwealth?" And I said, "Yes," thinking no, and then I said, uh, uh, "Well, you know, we had the Francophonie, which is, you know, as important as the Commonwealth." And then she said. It is very different and very similar. And then she left. Well, 
I could ask you more questions, but we don't have time, so um, we will do that a little bit later. And also, I want to get to the audience and allow a few people to ask a few questions. So, Monsieur Lacey, um, you have a wide range of subjects that you are an expert on, from the Ford Motor Company to the modern history of Saudi Arabia, en passant by, by the British monarchy. Um, and as uh, Bertrand alluded to, you are a historical consultant for the Netflix series, The Crown. That's why it's so historically accurate. You see. Ah, okay. I think some members of the royal family actually watch it, but I'm not sure many of them would admit to watching it, which is a different one. Anyway, I have immensely enjoyed this. Uh, it's superbly written, um, and I like... You've got a particular site, uh, style that I like, which is you're incisive um, and you're succinct. And I think probably the person that I am and the journalist that I am appreciates that. Isn't there anybody in the royal family that's slightly miffed that you are a historical consultant on Netflix, The Crown? I've no idea. I haven't. I haven't that Maybe that's a question. <laughs> it would be interesting to know. If it... so, I, 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 from everything one hears, they, they don't like The Crown. Um, I think the only member of the royal family who's expressed any approval of it is uh, Prince Harry, and of course they pay his wages, so maybe um, that's, that's connected. So here we are, this extraordinary woman who is known all over the world, who manages to remain an enigma. What do you think it is that fascinates the planet, really, about not just the fact that she's been on the throne for 70 years, but is there, is there that element of mystique? And is the younger generation, in a sense, in danger of becoming what they don't want to really become, which is celebrities? Um, I agree, yes. I, I, before I get onto that, though, I'd like to add just a little bit um, of my own research, well, it's, it's not, not special to me, about other tutors that um, uh, the Queen had in French um, she, she did, in fact, learn German as a, as a girl, um, but uh, the royal family didn't really encourage that, um, for perhaps obvious reasons. Um, and it, it, her, f her French lessons, uh, interestingly, are, are the only known occasion of rebellion and bad behavior on behalf, on behalf of the queen. Uh, you mentioned um, her nanny, Crawfy, who is the, the source for these stories. Um, but apparently, the, the Queen's first French tutor was a lady called Mademoiselle Wirtz, W-I-R-Z. Um, and according to um, uh, Crawfy, she made the Queen learn her way of teaching French. It's surprising her love for France survived, was to learn long lists of irregular French verbs that she had to write down. Um, but and the, the Queen, Queen survived. Well, the Queen rebelled against this. According to Crawfy, okay. one day she heard a scream coming from the room where um, uh, Elizabeth was learning French uh, with Madame Mademoiselle Wirtz. And she went in and she discovered that um, the, the, the princess was so furious, she had picked up an inkwell of blue ink and put it on her head. Um, and the, the, the ink was, was um, trickling down her face. So. Mamselle Wirtz didn't last very long, in fact. <laughs> um, and there were, uh, but, 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 but the love of French did, and, and there have been, you know, there were other, um, uh, there, there were, it, it was the habit in those days, I was talking to my um, wife, Jane, as we came over, in, in French, in, in English families, to have a Mamselle in the family, which was maybe a 1930s equivalent of an au pair girl, um, except she was more of a governess. And she used to beat you, didn't she, darling? Yes, with a cane. Yes, yes. A but French course, cane. A French cane, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and we won't tell them how you got revenge by killing her canary, will you? No, no. <laughs> that was a mistake, yes. Okay. No. No, so how happened. old was the queen when she put this inkwell over her head? Uh, the queen would have been quite young. I mean, uh, this was in the before the abdication, so the queen would have been eight, nine, ten years old. Um, and, uh, um, but as Mark says, she went on to become absolutely fluent in French um, and 
did in fact give a number of um, speeches in, 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 in French, including 10 minutes speaking French in, in French Canada. Um, anyway, to answer your much more difficult question, the mystique, um, um, I, I, I think you're quite right right at the beginning when you say that the distance she has kept between herself and the likes of us and the public as a whole um, is an important ingredient in that. Um, we should remember that she grew up at the knee of the founder of the House of Windsor. I mean, when, when, when the Queen was born uh, in 1926, the House of Windsor was in fact less than a decade old. It had only been created in 1917. And it had been created by her grandfather, George V, who although much maligned and not thought to be very intelligent, was the person who switched the identity from German to... Battenberg. This, the, to, to this Battenberg to Windsor. Battenberg to Windsor. I mean, Windsor, a brilliant brand name. Um, uh, and, um, uh, and the Queen was little pretty, of course, the other thing about the Queen, I think one of the reasons for her success is that she was not born expecting to be Queen. When she was born in 1926, mm -hmm. um, it, was the it was the custom laid down by Queen Victoria that any woman close to the succession had to have Victoria in her name in case it happened and she would become another Queen Victoria. And the Queen Mother apparently didn't like that. Um, she liked the names Elizabeth, um, Alexandra, Mary. Um, and they formally asked George V, can we have permission not to use Victoria? And apparently George V thought about it and looked at the list of succession and said, oh yes, I don't think that matters very much. Yes, that's fine. Um, but then of course, um, within, what's interesting, this is sort of a bit by the way, but within three or four years of her birth in 1926, George V became a member, the first member of the royal family to see the problems that were coming with David, um, um, the, the future Edward VIII. He actually predicted um, in 1929, I think, that the boy would ruin himself. Uh, he actually used the words abdication. We know this because, again, I think one of you mentioned Elizabeth Longford's book, The Queen, uh, written in conjunction with the Queen Mother. The Queen Mother actually said in the 1970s, we thought he was mad saying this. Uh, I think she said the word was ridiculous. Um, but uh, from that moment on, um, it, it, the, the Queen was brought up much more with a view to what was happening. But um, to finish um, answering your question, I think that she then became captain of the team. But unlike some members of the royal family, she never forgot she was part of a team. And she's always had that modesty. She's understood that she's actually part of a system. It's not all about her. It's all about something much more important. And hence we have these ideas like service and duty. Um, uh, this, of course, is coupled with her deep personal religious faith. Um, but uh, I think that mixture she has of grandeur um, and weight, but also modesty and humility that people sense um, are very important ingredients in her success. Yeah, I thought I was attracted to one or two or more, but I'll just quote two quotes. Um, you, what I'd like you is to do is to give us a few insights of the Queen in private, okay? The very public woman that we know. So in one quote you say, at 10 years old, Elizabeth already had her own style. Better to say too little than too much. I think that's very revealing. Yes. Um, and then also in your book, A Brief Life of the Queen, you write that then Prime Minister Harold Wilson, who we know she uh, respected and admired uh, greatly, then Postmaster General Anthony Wedgwood Ben, who of course was later known as Tony Ben, um, I quote you, failed to appreciate how the essence of Elizabeth's job was the concealing of her personal feelings. That's yes. quite revealing, isn't it, about this very public woman and how she sees her job, how she sees her role. How successful? Has she been more successful in passing that on to William than she has to Charles? Um, I think one would say that, yes, but that's not actually unusual. Much is made um, of um, the disagreements that do exist between... Um, um, uh, Charles and um, his mother, and I'm sure um, Arthur would have 
seen e examples of that, although it's, it's also greatly exaggerated. And the point I would make is that it's almost functional to monarchy. It is just not in the traditions of monarchy for monarchs ever to get along dreadfully well with their successors. Um, and, um, you know, the idea that's always been, oh, one day when she's 92, 94, she'll hand over to Charles as a regent. That just was never on the cards. Um, I mean, just, just, you know, just think of the idea of the queen handing over authority to a man who can't squeeze his own toothpaste. It, 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 it just uh, it, it doesn't make sense, but also it's, it's just not how she is. She's going to go on to the end, as we saw um, yesterday, as you mm. rightly said. Um, uh, there's, there's no doubt, though Charles read the speech, there was no sense in which he was a regent. Regent, of course, has a dirty, well, this not, not well, bad connotations in British history. I mean, the reason we had a regency was because the king went mad, George III. And there's no suggestion that the queen has lost any of her mental faculties, um, which are what matters. Yeah. Um, and uh, well, well, perhaps Arthur will address this, because um, he made a very good point, which I hadn't thought of until you made it, Arthur, and I'm going to make it for you, that in a way it's a pity she didn't appear in a wheelchair. Um, and uh, if she is immobile, um, uh, well, it, it would make such a difference to many people in this country who are immobile and are involved with immobile people if um, she wasn't um, scared to show it. But, well, they're um, described as episodic mm -hmm. mobility problems, which I spent all my live reports on France van Gett yesterday talking about and then translating into French. Mm. You're referring to the article that Arthur has written today yes. in, in, in The Sun. Mm. Let me ask you, I gather, and I did not know, so thank you very much, and perhaps some of my colleagues and the rest of the audience will be happy to know, is that there are French origins to the Jubilee? Ah, uh, yes. Um, but, um, yeah, you'll be delighted to hear this, that, the, 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 that there's, a, there's, a, there's a case for saying that the British Royal Jubilees have French origins. Um, a French origin, uh, uh, and jubilees are not particular to Britain either. Um, jubilees were originally religious festivals, um, Jewish religious festivals. The word jubal, a jubilee comes from the word jubal, the ram's horn, which is described in the Old Testament and is used in synagogues to this day um, as, 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 as a method of, of, of celebration. Um, uh, jubilees, therefore, were started in um, the, the early days of Judaism. They were then snitched. They were stolen by the French, but sorry, not by the French, by the, the you didn't steal everything. Um, the, the, Careful, uh, you're the digging a very big hole there, Robert. <laughs> sorry. The, the, um, I'm just thinking about continentals in general. Um, the, 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 pope, the popes stole jubilees in the Middle Ages um, mm -hmm. and used, and the, the 1200, 1300, popes started celebrating jubilees as a means of reaffirming um, uh, consent. If you're, if you're yes, not actually... Their authority. The, sorry? Their authority. Yes. And the consensus. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And then along comes the French Revolution, um, and suddenly you French, um, in the revolution itself, with anthems and flags and ceremonial, particularly taken up by Napoleon, who gave himself a better coronation than any European monarch had had up to that point, made all the monarchs of Europe sit up and take notice. And so it's no coincidence that the first English jubilee, British jubilee, was in 1809 for King George III. Um, other German princelings um, followed um, because, for the same reason, that um, if, if, if you're the head of an unelected institution, um, if you summon the people out on the streets to cheer you, that's about the best way you're going to demonstrate consent. And so, um, I mean, by 1809, George III had largely lost it, but the British government loved the idea of getting everybody out on the streets in these revolutionary times with Napoleon just across the channel um, and celebrating um, in, in a way that, well, maybe rivaled the way in which the French did public ceremony, and then, and then they were taken up by Queen Victoria, and of course, um, 
the, the Queen's first experience of a jubilee was in 1935, when her beloved grandfather, George V, attained his jubilee, um, and uh, that has been the case ever since. Robert, am I right in thinking that your biography was the first unauthorized one? Um, um, no, my, 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 my book, Majesty, which came out in 1977, was, I suppose, what you might call the first journalistic, um, okay. or I would like to say historical and analytical um, biography of the Queen. Until, until, the mid, um, and, and, until that jubilee, um, the tradition in um, most British reporting was very um, obsequious. Um, it was written by ex-nannies. The, the court correspondent was somebody who spoke on bended knee and wrote on bended knee all the time. And I was part of a, I don't take the credit myself, I was part of a new generation of which Arthur was a part, um, which took a, a new, more journalistic attitude towards the monarchy, saw it, I mean, very importantly, uh, uh, as an important part of, of British life, but worthy of the same sort of scrutiny and examination that was, was given to politics. And what was the reaction at the time? Because this was therefore different. This was not the conventional approach. Did you notice a change in your relationships and in people being uh, open to you? Did you get well, I, less I, access? I, I, I haven't been a royal correspondent before. I was a young journalist on the Sunday Times working on Insight, doing investigations. And so I, I decided to try to apply those techniques to reporting about the royal family. And um, um, no, I, I, I was welcomed. I mean, when okay. I went to Buckingham Palace, um, I, I mean, I wrote to the private secretary of the day, a man called Martin Charteris, um, and explained I was trying to write a different sort of book. And no, I got invited to the palace. And um, uh, I don't think he quite expected. I mean, in those days, um, um, it, it, young journalists tend to have long hair, um, um, leather jackets. Um, uh, and, was that uh, you? Uh, well, I, I refused to change my style to, but just because I was going to Buckingham Palace. These days, I'm, I'm color a Thai man. But, um, so I remember Martin Charles looking a bit askance at me as I came in. And he said, how can I help you, sir? Um, and I said, well, I'd like to write a book about the Queen. He said, well, that's my subject. And um, the, the rest followed. And I mean, it's not just me, as I say. The, 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 it reflected a whole change in, 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 in the attitude of what was then called Fleet Street. Yep. I was the first to write a book. Um, Arthur was reporting in a different way. And of course, the royal family did respond because, what was it, 1979 saw the royal family film when they made their own attempt at um, reporting on themselves. Do you mean when we saw them having a picnic and they were using Tupperware to the great shock and horror of the nation? Yes. And, oh, and you, okay. saw, you saw Prince Philip um, barbecuing, you saw the queen she mixing, you saw the queen mixing salad dressing, which actually brings me back to France because the queen has two things rather delightfully banal that she said about um, the British and the French. One is that we are like oil and vinegar. Um, uh, she doesn't say which is the oil and which is the vinegar. Um, but when we get on, we make a great salad dressing. Um, and she's rather fond of her, the salad dressing she makes. And then the other is, she several times said it, we drive on opposite sides of the road, but we are both going in the same direction. Interesting. Now, it, I was just having a quick glance, which I hadn't done in a while, actually, um, about opinion polls. Um, and it shows that sh she has an extraordinary approval uh, rating. And it's quite interesting to see, um, you know, who's doing well on that chart. So right after Queen Elizabeth, there's actually Prince William, so the Queen is on 75%, Prince William 66%, Prince Philip, interestingly, 64%, Kate 60%, Princess Anne 52, Prince Charles 50, Sophie 44, I heard a gasp down there, or was it a sigh? Um, Camilla 40, Zara Phillips 39%, Prince Edward 34, anybody care to know where Prince Harry is? Number 11. Uh, 32%, uh, Meghan 14 position, 14th position, she has 24%, and as for Prince Andrew, he's in 15th position, 12%. But his arrow's going up, so might go up, might go down. Um, so it's looking pretty good for the Platinum Jubilee, 
Um, and of course, I think we're all hoping that we're going to see the Queen on the balcony on that, the first day of that extraordinary four-day celebration that the nation is invited to actually celebrate. What will you be doing during the Platinum Jubilee? Probably talking to myriad foreign correspondents, a spattering of British ones. I, um, well, like Arthur, uh, I'll be reporting it. I will actually be, um, I'll be working for the BBC as what's known as a presenter's friend. Oh, yes, we know um, about that. The plus I'll, one, they call it. Yes, I, I'll, also, yeah. I'll be on the BBC News Channel uh, with... Um, um, you know, available to, to, yeah. to, to, to put in... Uh, the, the odd comments, and of course, who is on the Jubilee balcony will be very interesting, although we have already been told. Last week, um, the royal correspondents and those of us who write about the, the, the family were invited to Buckingham Palace for a briefing which is supposed to be secret, but which has been written about. Um, and that's when, I mean, the main purpose of that meeting was to say who would be on the balcony. Um, which was actually another way of saying who would not be on the balcony. Um, and um, we were told, as you must have read in the papers, it would be effectively, well, it, not effectively, it would be the working members of the royal family, those who are on the payroll in one way or another, with one, with one additional person, it was rather interesting, um, uh, Commander Tim Lawrence, who, of course, Sir Tim Lawrence, who is Princess Anne's um, Second husband. Second husband. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, what was interesting about that, I mean, it's not surprising when you think about it, but the way in which the palace explained why he was there, because he is quiet and modest and loyal and supports the family as a team member, those words were used, were, were actually, of course, a way of explaining why certain other people were not on the balcony. I wonder who uh, they could have been referring to and thinking... Oh, I think it's time to invite our surprise guest. He's not a surprise. Please come and join us, Arthur. Um, it's wonderful that you are here, and I think we're going to be lucky enough you're going to share some of your photographs. Oh, sorry. Can so just sorry. before, Arthur, oh. since you've got General de Gaulle up there, I have to tell just one other story about Go right the, Queen's, ahead. the Queen's linking. With, and, 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 excuse me. We're, we're largely an adult audience here. Um, but uh, you know this story, you know what's coming. Um, um, the, the Queen's job, part of her soft power, was very much deployed in the years we were getting constantly vetoed by de Gaulle. So she worked very hard at trying to be friendly with him and also with Madame de Gaulle. Yvonne. Uh, Yvonne. And she asked on one occasion, um, looking forward to, well, not obviously trying not to say she was looking forward to General de Gaulle's um, retirement, um, he, uh, she asked Yvonne what sh she was looking forward to when her husband gave up work. Um, and Yvonne replied, um, excuse my bad imitation of a French um, accent, I am hoping for a penis. <laughs> and there was embarrassed silence. And the queen, of course, leapt forward instantly and said, we are all looking for happiness. <laughs> Sorry. Gosh, you come with an X rating, I think. I'm going to have to put that in my book. I'm going to have to remember the next time I'm on stage with you and hosting something. Very good. Okay, well, when French and Anglo relations are concerned, maybe that's not such a surprising anecdote. I'm not going to add anything more to that. So thank you, well, perhaps thank you for that anecdote about General de Gaulle and the Queen. So let's get to your photos, of which you've taken many. You've accompanied the Queen on all her tours uh, in France. You have taken photos of her with Presidents Mitterrand, Chirac, Hollande, Sarkozy. Who have I forgotten? President Reagan, President Clinton, President... Uh, every, every, anniversary, every anniversary of uh, D-Day, they all assemble, and uh, she meets them all. And uh, I think the last one, Putin, was there as well, so... Yeah, she, she, um, she's very connected. In fact, the first time I went to France was in 1984 for the D-Day celebrations. And they were all the, pre the president, the, the king of uh, Norway, all the, they were all on the beach together, a big lineup. And so going there um, every time she went was, was, was okay, you know, but 
it's very formal in France. You know, everything's so formal, and uh, and it's just difficult to get her the way we like her, which is you know smiling down the lens, which is which when she smiles down the lens, you know that, that it lights up the room. It's just. And, and it's all very intense. I remember when they opened the Channel Tunnel with Mitterrand. I was there. Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was all about this big wheel and the Queen and, and Mitterrand looking at this wheel, but it was a boring picture. But that was uh, a great event, and she was there. And for that, and of course, uh, several other visitors. The last one, I think, was um, when President Hollande, and after she went to, uh, the, to, to Bayou Cemetery, and then afterwards went up and... She did a walkabout with him and it started to rain and he passed through his umbrella and it was quite a nice picture. But um, no, it's uh, interesting about Robert, about the Queen's sense of humour, uh, which reminded me of a story when she was uh, walking at Balmoral and uh, with her policeman. And the policeman told me the story, so it's true. And they met two American tourists. And these American tourists said to the Queen, have you ever met the Queen? And she said, no, but he has, pointing to the police <laughs> and, uh, and, of course, the, 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 they immediately want to talk to the Queen, but talk to the policeman. And uh, they were chatting to him. and said, oh, yeah, I've met her lots of times. You know? oh. And they turned to the Queen and gave him their camera. And they said, would you take a picture of us? With, with... <laughs> and the Queen took the picture, gave him back the camera, and walked on her way. Talk about so, a missed opportunity. So, yeah. you know, she's got fantastic... And I just want to tell one more story yeah. about that. When um, we, were at, we were up at Sandringham and Prince Charles was there with a girlfriend. This was before he was married. And it was, it was really intense, you know. There was a big pack of uh, press up there. And we were told, all the editors told us, that on no account must you harass the Queen. So we're all in this field. Prince Charles is in the field with this girl shooting, and we're waiting for him to come out. And the Queen turned up. And she was a headscarf and her old coat, and she opens the back of her Land Rover, lets all the dogs out. No one takes a picture. She looks around. Everybody's got the cameras on the ground. And she walks away, and she said to her policeman, what was all that about? And he said, well, they've told ma'am on no account. I say, Harris, you. She said, I don't know what's worse, she said, being Harris or being ignored. <laughs> <laughs> so sweet. So there that's you go. Terrific. So, you know, she's got a great sense of humour, and that's... Tell me, you were telling me a story earlier on this evening about the Queen's car broke down and you roped... Well, Probably what happened, a naughty word, some gendarme into pushing her car. Well, I did, yeah. What happened? We were in uh, Bone. We went to this hospice there. Which the Hospice a, de Bone. That's right. It's got a fantastic yeah. roof. But, of course, you can't get the Queen and the roof in the same picture, so it was really difficult. And we were walking around, and it was absolutely dreadful, no pictures. And we came out, and we'd driven all the way down from Paris to this. And, um, and I noticed that the Queen's car was still there. And I checked, and it had broken down, and they put her in another car and whisked her back to, back, to, back to Paris. So I got four gendarmes to push the Queen's car down the road. It was, like, you know, it was broken down, and got that in the paper the next day. So <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a wasted trip, but, you know, sometimes it was a bit difficult like that. But the, um, the time, that, that the picture that everybody really wanted with the Queen was after 1984, when President Reagan and Mrs. Reagan walked among their gravestones in, in uh, Normandy. It was a wonderful picture. It dominated all the British papers the next day. And the Queen at Bayou Cemetery was just pretty dull. And so the next time, we asked if just the Queen and the Duke could walk amongst the graves, and they did. And, we, you know, we, and that was one thing that, that changed everything. And then from then on, it was awareness that you know, visual is everything, these things, and, uh, and, and she cooperated. But, um, you know, the Queen is, is, a, is a really nice person, and, and, and she's very formal, and she's very nervous, and she's, and she's shy, you know, you wouldn't believe she's it. She's very nervous, that's not a word we've no, often had associated. No, and she's shy, and uh, I remember at the Great Hall of the People uh, in China, and she was absolutely dreading making this speech, you know, and... Uh, and a, and, a, and, a, and a lady in waiting was continually giving her glasses of water. And she made this really nice speech. And afterwards, she relaxed and she was sort of enjoying herself, you know, and she was really tense about that. And so, you know, even though she's been doing this for 70 years, 
she still doesn't come, you know, it's not something she relishes. But yesterday I was in the House of Lords, Prince Charles made the speech, and I know that he'd been given that a few days earlier and he did a brilliant job. But sitting next, next to the, uh, the prince was the crown, which the Queen has stopped wearing because it's too heavy for her now. And I just made a, did a piece in the paper this morning saying, you know, it's too heavy and, and maybe, you know, the others have now got to step up to the plate. But of course they have. I mean, the Queen hasn't done a, an investiture for 18 months now. She just can't stand that long. And so they're taking over now. I agree with Robert. I don't think the Queen will ever uh, abdicate or retire, but she will have to really, really uh, absolutely take it easy now and just pass the work on to everybody else. Yes, I mean, this is transition yeah, it is. time. It's not, as you were saying, Robert, a time for regency, and they're very clear about no. that. I think we need to open it up to questions to the audience. So um, is, there a, is there a microphone somewhere about um, that we can ask people? Just before we do that, can we put the photos that we chose um, that are Arthur's? Can we look at them now? Can you yeah. see them? Yeah, can, Could you yeah. just give us a, a, a quick... That was in the rain. About yeah. Where it was, put the microphone next to your mouth. So it was in the Arc de Triomphe, the, the Tomb of the Unknowns. So what year was that? Oh, God, I don't know. <laughs> about 2000, well, no, no, about he, 96, 7, something like that. Yes, uh, because he was president from yeah. 95 to 2002. Yeah, I'm and uh, that was. Uh, 2007, even. Yeah. Merci. Yeah, so Thank you. that was uh, really. Um, yeah, just pouring with rain, but you know, the Queen looks wonderful, as always. Yep. What's the next one? Uh, this is so cosy in London. I love the Queen's hat. I like the jacket, not the colour hat. we often see on her. All the birds went down for that hat. <laughs> All the birds <laughs> went down for that hat. <laughs> I mean, uh, no, she looks really, I mean, as she say when she smiles, and he was charming, and I tell you, on that trip, I went to uh, a talk at Marlborough House with Carla Bruni gave a magnificent speech. I've never forgotten it. She was early, really changed my view of her. Mm -hmm. um, well, this is President Hollande offering of the umbrella. This is in Paris. Yeah. I think this was, uh, uh, was it 2014? It could have been anyway. Um, but um, there she's really, uh, she'd just come from Bayou where she laid the reef at the, mm -hmm. uh, the British Cemetery. Is that it? I think it's her, isn't it? Is there one more? Oh, oh. wow, she's uh, extraordinary. The queen yeah. at the That's banquet, quite a yeah, at the Lisa, yeah. yeah. Oh no, she's a. I mean, she scrubs up well. The queen, I must say, <laughs> she really does. And uh, and you know, and there's pictures. I've got pictures of her with a headscarf and an old coat. Uh, and you'd think that's the Queen of England. And then you look at that and you think, my God. You know, that's what I mean when she smiles, it lights up the room and, and you know you've got to be patient when you're working with it. You know every, just be patient, be patient, be patient and you will get that, you'll get that smile at one stage. Uh, I mean, she's a real professional, the Queen. She knows what, uh, what you need and, uh, and, she, and she gives it to you. And when I got my MBE, I must tell you this story, uh, I was not always this pleasant. I mean, in them early days, I was really aggressive. The whole newspaper industry was aggressive then. It was just you, you just went out, as Robert said, the whole thing changed reporting on the royal family. And um, she gave me this medal. She gave it to me. She said, I can't believe I'm giving you this. <laughs> 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 and I said, well, thank you, ma'am. And she said, how long have you been coming down here? taking pictures of me, and I, that was, was 20 years ago at this, I said, 27 years, ma'am. She said, well, let's have our pictures taken together. <laughs> Peace broke out. But, um, no, so I've, uh, I've enjoyed working with her. I haven't taken a picture of her now since for s six months, seven months, October. Yeah. Uh, last, two, the last occasion was, was she was at Westminster Abbey where I photographed her with a walking stick, and then two weeks later at Windsor Castle, where she was greeting all these big investors in Britain, all these very wealthy people. All the, all the cabinet was there and it was a big event. And the following day I went to Northern Ireland to um, where she was going to visit a, a, a church and, and to, to a service. And she went to hospital and, and ever since then she's not moved. She went briefly to the, the Duke of Edinburgh's memorial service, but she went in the back door, we never saw her. So it's, when will we see her next? And, and it's the, 
The Platinum Jubilee is all about the Queen. It's only the Queen, and, it's, and everybody wants to see the Queen. And I'm told she's going to try and go to the Derby, and she's going to definitely try and get to St Paul's for the service, because she's a very, very Christian woman. She's, um, and, and if we just get to see her once, I think it will be tremendous, but we live in hope. Am I right in thinking that there is a column um, in St George's Chapel in Windsor and that for the Duke of Edinburgh's funeral, Prince Philip's funeral, you, there's a cavity in a column and you were in it? Oh, no, that was... Uh, no. What happened, they built at the west doors of the uh, St George's Chapel, there's a, the steps up, which is where the coffin was carried. Next to the door, they built a hide and there was oh. just a little slit. Mm -hmm. And I was in there, and I had to get in there three hours before. Wow. And, uh, and you know the problems when you're somewhere three hours and you can't get out. <laughs> <coughs> Reality <coughs> but, kicks in. But yes. I, had a, I, had a, I had a glass of water at six in the morning, didn't have another drink. But, <laughs> but it was, but, you know, people said, how did you pass your time? Well, it was amazing because there were soldiers fainting, they were falling over, there was just, everything was going on. But the, when they, those Marines carried that picture up the steps I got the best picture and uh, and it was and it was you know the, the weight was worth it the it was it was just tremendous and um, and uh, but when I was doing it they stood there for a minute and during that minute I was photographing it and I was thinking about the Duke you know the Duke wasn't the easiest person to get on with I mean he was he was a rogue I mean he used to uh, <clears throat> He used to scream at the French paparazzi at sounding him in French, <laughs> uh, and, and, and he was, uh, and he was um, no friend of the media, but he was mm -hmm. a fantastic consul, and uh, and I think the Queen misses him more than we know, and it's probably since he's died, she's really gone downhill fast. You photographed seven royal weddings, four funerals, eight royal births, three of which we attended together, together for yeah. hours and hours. Yeah. People think that the, our profession is extremely glamorous. No, you know, forget a loo break. Just oh, don't drink anything no, all day don't long. Drink nothing, no. You know, um, from about four seasons in one day outside the Lindo wing. But it's extraordinary because that's how friendships are, yeah. um, are, are made, um, aren't they? Let's open it up um, to uh, anybody who would like to ask a, a question. You can be French, you can be British, you can ask anything you would like. Do I have a hand? Oh, two up at the same time. So I'm going to go with Carol in the second row and then the gentleman over there. Oh, sorry. Am I starting? Yes. Well, first of all, fascinating stuff, absolutely fascinating, and thank you very much indeed. Uh, I just wonder, Prince Philip was, of course, you know, what is he, just, just get on with it, and he was that sort of man, and you look at them from when they met, when they were in love, etc. Do you think she was always, from the relationship point of view, a happy woman, or do you think that she was a woman who just sort of, you know, took it in her stride? I just wonder... Uh, you're asking me to start with, uh, but he's... She's uh, looking uh, at uh, you, uh, Robert. Yes, I'm going to pass it over to Arthur as well, because he would have seen them working much more together. But you, you are, from the beginning, you know, historically, before Arthur and I were there, I, uh, I could only speak on, behalf, on, you know, on the part of looking at the documents. Um, you know, the, the, the thing to say about, uh, that I know we can say about the Queen and Philip, is that she fell in love with him the first time she saw him, um, and that never changed. Um, I mean, that, that is absolutely clear from mm. Crawfee, um, who, although you know, discredited for spilling the beans, was a very accurate reporter. Um, and uh, if you see the letters, um, uh, no, she, she, she first set eyes on him, we think, in 1939, when she would have only been 13. Um, they may have met before um, at the, the family occasions, but the famous occasion we know was 1939, just at the outbreak of war, she went with her parents to visit Dartmouth Naval College, and Lord Mountbatten, who was um, chairing the whole thing, made very sure that um, she spent a lot of time with um, his nephew, he was, wasn't he, Philip? Um, and, um, uh, you know, but, but for all the talk of Mountbatten engineering the relationship, um, uh, it, it was based on absolute um, um, love on her part and, and, and also on his, though he, he, he would have been more complicated. What, what Thank would you, you have to say? Yeah. Oh, I must tell you about the Duke and the Queen. Um, you know, uh, 
he was a tough man, the Duke. He really was a, he was his own man, and he was a captain of his own ship. And, uh, but the Queen wouldn't put up with it, you know. If, if he was bullying her, she would stand up for herself. And I always remember once uh, we were at the Guildhall, and they were signing the visitor's book. And the Queen signed first, of course. And then the Duke went to sign. And uh, he, wrote, he said to her, what's the date? And she said, November the 14th, Charles's birthday. <laughs> And, uh, and I've been told that they could have a blazing row. Well, I know they could have a blazing row on the way to the event. When they got out of the car, they just went into just perfect royal mode. Um, but she was, I mean, she wouldn't be bullied by him. Obviously, she's her own woman. She's a tough woman herself. But they, they loved each other so much. I mean, the pictures, at the last tour of Australia in 2011, I remember the last day in Perth, and they were walking through the, 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 this, this big barbecue, and the Duke was bringing flowers over to her. And the way they looked at each other, the way they looked at each other, you knew that there was that, still that spark there. And I've got several pictures like that where, you know, and, and of course I remember once at Sandringham and he wasn't feeling too great. And he went and asked the Queen's permission if he could leave. And I thought that was just tremendous, you know. And so really in spite of the fact that he was indeed his own man, as, as someone said here, well, I mean, when he was photographed with the... With the um, about the Britain pilots and the photographer was being fussy and he said, Get the, mate, just take the effing picture. I mean, he was like that and he, and he, would, and he would let you have it both barrels. I mean, he wasn't, uh, wasn't slow to do that. He had no time for the media, but he was a great consul. And, uh, and if you saw that picture of the Queen sitting in the pew at the castle at the, at the funeral, I mean, that was a sad picture. I was going to ask picture. you about that. Oh, sad I mean. picture, that picture. Mm. I mean... It just haunts me, really, to see her there suffering and sitting on her own. It was terrible. I think the nation got oh. that. Obviously, some individuals didn't. No comment. Do yeah. um, yeah. you have a question? Yeah. Um, given the example of the Queen, do you think the French people would like the restoration of the monarchy or to remain a republic? <laughs> well, Robert's laughing, but I'm actually going to go to Marc first yeah, on that one, if I may. Um, well, I've been only once at uh, banquet at the Elysee. And as I said, it's exactly the same grandeur as it is in Windsor, exactly the same uh, uh, glamour, the same magic. So there's no need to go to royalty. France has a republican monarchy. Robert, you yes, laughed. And, uh, I, you know, I, I, I'd say this is a... You know, um, I've always loved France, right from my early days when I go on French exchanges. I've worked in French West Africa for a whole year, and um, I've always been struck and enormously impressed by when the Queen said, your, um, your um, French family of nations um, is the same but different from our Commonwealth. Um, I, that, that's very wise. Your language... Uh, your belief um, in the Republic um, and not being monarchical um, are strong ideas um, which have enormous validity. Um, uh, so um, uh, we, sentimentally, the British, have our crown. Rupert Murdoch, whenever asked, um, you know, doesn't he think uh, Britain should get rid of the monarchy? He said, the, you know, the poor, pathetic Brits wouldn't survive without the sentimentality of the monarchy, which, of course, makes so much money for him, but that's another point. Um, so I, 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 I think our attitude to the monarchy, and, uh, which is essentially to the ideals of our society and countries, um, say a lot about us as, as two, different, two different peoples. Thank you, Robert. Yes. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to know... Um, whether you believe that the Queen thinks she's anointed by God, uh, and presumably the French president does not. <laughs> well, I'll just jump in there um, uh, quickly, but I know Arthur's got things to say. He's, I mean, the, the Queen is a woman of, as Arthur said, of deep Christian faith. Um, uh, uh, does that in its own right? I mean, it is thought that she kneels and says her prayers every day. Um, the only book about herself that she has ever endorsed 
is a book that came out four years ago produced by the Bible Society called um, The Servant Queen and the Master She Serves. And she writes at the beginning about being herself, the, not just the servant of um, Britain, but the servant of a greater monarch. So that's absolutely literally her belief. I mean, if you want to get into the theology of it, she used to go to Billy Graham rallies when Billy Graham brought his evangelism to Britain. She would invite Billy Graham to come and have lunch with her after the sermon. And he tells one wonderful story of how she praised his sermon that he gave, um, but he had thought about doing another one about how Jesus um, told the, the sick man to take up his bed and walk. And her eyes sparkled, he said, and she said, oh, that is my favorite story. I wish you'd told that. So that's the element of, perhaps Arthur can add to, about you know, how she sees the monarchy. Well, um, I've been twice um, to uh, Rome, to the Vatican, when the Queen's met uh, Pope John Paul and recently Pope Francis. And when the Queen goes, sorry, can you? Was it near your mouth? Oh, sorry. Yeah. When the Queen goes to, when any um, head of state, a woman goes to uh, meet the Holy Father, they have to normally get dressed in black and, and have their hair covered. And the Queen, before she was going to meet Pope Francis, she went to have lunch with the Italian president. And then the palace, Buckingham Palace, uh, rang uh, the Pope's protocol office and said, look, can, you, can we put the visit back half an hour so the Queen can go back to the embassy and get changed? And the Pope said, no, let her come as she is. And the Queen came in this most beautiful <laughs> coat and dress and, and they sat together and they both laughed out loud together. It was just the most amazing thing to see. And the, it, was, it was tremendous. And when we went with uh, Pope John Paul, the Queen gave him these two bound leather volumes of Canaletto paintings. The Queen's got the largest selection of Canaletto paintings in the world, and he gave her rosary beads, which I got a picture of him giving her, and this uh, old fat, this antique copy of the New Testament. When she went with John Paul, when she went with Pope Francis, she took a huge hamper of produce from the Sandringham estate <laughs> and said, I know you won't keep this yourself and give it away. And then the Duke explained about the liqueur and the, and the, and the ham and everything. It was just an uh, amazing event. And though the Queen, goes to church every Sunday. If recently the, the, the priest has come to her, uh, she drives, she doesn't go to St. George's Chapel, so she drives to Royal Lodge, where she used to go every week with the Queen Mother, and she still goes there on a Sunday. She drives herself normally as well. So, uh, very Christian woman. Um, as she says, at Christmas time, you know, she mentions what Christmas is all about. She makes that very clear to the people. It's you know, it's the birth of, birth of Christ. So, you know, um, I think Prince Wales is true. I mean, I, I've been everywhere I go in the world with Prince Charles. Every Sunday he goes to church. So I think, the, um, I think it's pretty strong in the family, yeah. I just want to, uh, for an observer, uh, I find the link between uh, the monarchy and the Anglican church and the lack of separation of state and church at a time where society in this country is getting more and more secular, less and less Christian, is one of the big issues. I think one way on or another, when King Charles will be there, there will have to be a separation, like he's in favor, uh, between a state and religious, because it's such an anachronism. For an observer. That because is, he said that that is just what a Frenchman would say, and good for you. But um, I can only say that talking to um, members of the Commonwealth um, and, and, and um, uh, uh, non-Christians in this country, particularly Muslims and Hindus, when I talk to them about the, 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 the Queen being so Christian, um, they like the fact that um, she has a faith they find that reaffirming to their own faiths, which matter so much to them. And so that is a, you know, another dimension of our commonwealth of nations, which um, 
you know, is a difference. But very briefly, um, we've known for over 10 years now that uh, Prince Charles is thinking of saying that he's keeper, not of the faith in the singular, but keeper of the faiths in the plural. That has been something that's been in the public domain for a long time. I want to go to two more questions. One to the gentleman over there, or maybe three. Um, so let's take those two questions. So when you've finished, yes. if you could hand it to that lady, and then we'll come in. Yes. Right. First of all, thank you fa uh, so much for the fabulous insight into the Queen and our life. Uh, in a historical and geopolitical context, do you think that the Queen sees France as the old enemy? Uh, the old enemy of England and the broader United Kingdom, or conversely, more as the Entente Cordiale that was, you know, the, effectively triggered by the vi visit of Queen Victoria in 1843 with King Louis Philippe in France, or a combination of both. Marc, vas-y. Yes, I, from having attended the, the banquet for the anniversary of the Entente Cordiale when Shira came, um, uh, there's no doubt that France is seen as um, the essential uh, power um, uh, in the eyes of the Queen. I mean, there's no doubt the, the grandeur of that event um, and the emphasis on the Entente Cordiale. And I have a German colleague who was really upset about it all because he said, you know, Germany is the most important country in <laughs> Europe. And she hardly mentioned Germany, although she has been in official visits. But France, I think, is at the center. So it's really, and that's the great danger when she disappears, that her hair might not have the same emphasis on the Entente Cordiale. Can I go to this lady here um, and then we'll yes, go to the second I, I want to just bring up her Christi her Christianity, which is, extends beyond Christianity. I think she has a very compassionate nature. And I think the best example is that is when she had Dr. David Nott to a banquet the day after he came from Aleppo. He's a surgeon who teaches war surgery, does it on WhatsApp, YouTube. He absolutely goes through with indigenous surgeons um, to, to save people's lives. And he's just come back from Ukraine. And he sat next to her, and he, he was, it was such a culture change from being in Aleppo mm. to, to coming into the, um, into the palace and sitting next to Her Majesty. And she could see this. She just, she just didn't speak to him. She just said, how are you? And then she noticed that he was completely speechless. She, he was so shocked. And he, she said, let's just go out in the, in the garden and feed the dogs. Will you come with me? And I think that is just about sums her up, her sensitivity to people's feelings. And as regards her sense of humor, I also happen to know one of the, her very long-standing um, ladies-in-waiting, the Honorable Mary Morrison, and she always tells us stories about her wicked sense of humor, her kind of sense of irony about, about the press as much as anything else. So I just thought I'd share those two Thank you. stories. So I've been lucky enough to go once to um, the throne room in Archbishop's house, the, uh, where the Cardinal for England and Wales is. And what was interesting is it was quite last minute thing. So I was part of the Royal Rota. Uh, it was just, I think, two photographers, me and one other person. And what was interesting is I was not there to talk to him. I was there to observe him. And so for about an hour and a half, which I've actually never reported on and spoken about publicly, because we do a lot of things, like we all do, in background, just to get a sense of the person. And I think that really opened my eyes. It was a lot of the um, Syrian, Iraqi, Chaldean communities and how actually Prince Charles does a lot of outreach, and he, he was listening, actually. What struck me is he did more listening, far more listening. Maybe the ratio, I didn't think about it, maybe if I think about it now, was probably about 75% listening, or maybe 80% listening, to the stories of people. Uh, one man I spoke to was the uncle of two children who had become orphans because his brother and his sister-in-law had died, and he was literally going to be leaving Westminster to go down a train, train boat, whatever it was, to go and rescue. But he didn't know if he could do all the paperwork that was necessary. But he knew that the one thing in his life he wanted to do is to get to know and to save this niece and this nephew that he hardly knew. But 
they were his blood relatives and he wanted to do that. So it's quite interesting because they're such public people um, and we'll see how the next generation is. Yes. Thank you for sharing your stories. Very much. I was just wondering, you know, considering she uh, learned French and had, uh, I mean, has such an attachment um, for fr France and maybe um, French um, products, let's say, how far is she authorized by the protocol to actually um, demonstrate this other than love of champagne or, I mean, for instance, you know, would she be allowed to has she been allowed during her life to um, wear haute couture um, by French, um, you know, stylists um, et, or other, other other links which would, you know, um, demonstrate her, her love for French um, culture then, yeah. or know-how? Let's yeah. find out if someone knows. Well, um, I, Mark? I can only say that uh, every time we go on an event with the Queen, we're can you hear me? All right. We're told we're told um, who made the dress and who made the coat. And in 40 years, I've never heard a Frenchman mentioned. <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing I'd say is that, uh, as uh, as Arthur knows, um, uh, the, the, yeah, the, the the Queen's costume. Um, I look on this as a, as an historian. We 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 look on the fact that the Queen wears clothes. Um, uh, it's not surprising she couldn't wear French clothes or any other designer clothes because she actually, we, we think when we see that lady um, in that funny, oh, look, look Arthur, uh, what Arthur said about the hat for the birds. I mean, we think that's what a, an elderly lady wears. I've never seen an elderly lady in the street wearing a hat like that <laughs> or the costume that she wears. These bright lime colors, these bright purples are not what... Um, women of her style or age wear. She's actually wearing a uniform just like the first Elizabeth. Um, and she has this lady that I'm sure Arthur knows, uh, Angela Kelly, um, now for what's it, over 20 years, with whom, can you talk about that other, with whom she's formed a very close relationship? She's not, uh, she's her personal assistant now. Yes. Says it on her business card. She wears her shoes in, doesn't she? Uh, she, she just, I mean, her and the queen, they just chat about everything. And she always says to Angela, have you got any, any gossip, Angela? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the Queen loves gossip, but oh. um, the, uh, the clothes she wears, as, as Robert says, you know, are always bright because when she gets out of the car, some people uh, way away watching and they always know which one's the Queen. She's the one that wears beautiful reds and pinks and greens and blues and a lot of us during when we're waiting for the queen to tour when we used to wait for the queen to turn up we would all have bets what color she was going to wear <laughs> and, I've, and i've never won yet so <laughs> so she just gives and and every everything is laid out every day she has a choice of three brooches the langella kelly puts out three brooches for her to choose and uh, three outfits and the queen chooses and then there what she worn that day is filed away and the, when she wore it and what occasion it was. And the, and the wardrobe's vast, vast. Uh, that's why she needs big Buckingham Palace. Mm. And, <laughs> and she will spend a lot of time with Angela Kelly, I mean, half a day, um, working out her costumes for, the, for in the days when she did appear more in public. Um, and all the associations, well, I'm going to Coventry last time and they've got it on file, what she wore last time. Um, and there are particular reasons why she'd wear particular colors in particular places. It, 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 it's a very um, highly developed professionalism that she's got, and as Arthur says, she, she had a friend who was a dresser before, didn't she? Um, yeah, but um, Angela's the one. Um, when, uh, she, and sorry, just to bring, oh. Angela is a Liverpool docker's daughter. Oh, yes, that's yeah. right. Um, with a Liverpool accent that the Queen mimics, doesn't it? Yeah. She makes yeah. fun of it. Yeah. But um, Angela told me this story, and I'll tell you. Uh, when the Queen was going to Washington, and it was George, the second George Bush, uh, was going uh, to be this big welcoming ceremony on the White House lawn. And the Queen and Angela had made a uh, navy blue and white outfit for her. And the Queen was doing an investiture the week before, and she, every other woman came up was wearing navy blue and white outfits. So the 
Angela told me this, so it's true. So it's, the Queen said, Angela, she said, I think navy and white's common. <laughs> and Angela said, I don't do common, ma'am. <laughs> and the Queen wore the outfit. Yeah, it was, uh, it was a lovely story. No, that, that's, our, that's the relation, you know. I mean, they just, they just, they're like two mates. Uh, and... Uh, well, and even the most powerful people need support. This is what, in the image of the yeah. public, sometimes they forget, you know. If you had to use one word about the Queen, what is it, Robert? Duty. Mark? Extraordinary longevity. Yeah, I think, I think it's duty, 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 yeah. I mean, she's, uh, she just gets on with it, and, uh, and she just does it with a smile on her face. Well, hopefully. <laughs> Well, she's reigned for 70 years. We're all invited to the Jubilee party. If you like crowds, then you know where to go. If you don't like crowds, then do your own street party, that we're all encouraged uh, to do that. I would really like to thank very much, uh, so uh, you, uh, Robert Lacey, you've got Mark Hosh, and you've got Arthur Edwards. Um, thank you so very much for being here, for sharing your insights. I think we've picked up and gleaned quite a few uh, details along the way, whether it's about uh, the Queen herself, about her entourage. And I think we can all tonight maybe just say whether we are Republicans in the French sense of the word uh, or we are Royalists. Long live the Queen. Uh, may she continue to be uh, very healthy. And who knows if it will be King Charles or he'll choose one of his other Christian names. Can I invite you uh, to help me thank not only my guests, but also the French Institute, uh, Bertrand, uh, who is directing the suit, Mathias, who helped me, uh, supported me in preparing tonight. Thank you very much indeed for asking me to chair this. I feel that I've done quite a bit of my preparation, but it's never enough. Always got to do more uh, for the Platinum Jubilee reportage that um, I'll be doing on France 24. And do check out the French Institute website. It has got such a wide range of things for you to explore. And it's a fantastic way to meet not just French people, but all kinds of people come here. Et si vous voulez apprendre le français, if you'd like to test your French, do it in a fun way. Uh, I started out at the BBC when I was 15, 16, teaching French, and it's like exercise. Don't do a thousand push-ups and then you can't walk for a week. Just do 10 a day. So if you just come and explore the French films, all the French richness that there is here, I'm sure you'll be given a warm welcome. Thank you very much indeed for being here tonight. Bonsoir.